Well, good evening. You may be seated. I was actually assigned my topic for tonight. When I got the email, I immediately thought of similar topics that I had been given in previous engagements. One, in Bucaramanga, Colombia. Uh, an another, uh, in Erbil, in northern Iraq. And another, in Alexandria, Egypt. And as you can imagine, in Bucaramanga, or in Erbil, uh, or uh, perhaps in Alexandria, or in other places where I've spoken on similar subjects like Jakarta in Indonesia, context is really different. In modern America, we talk about these unprecedented times that we live in. There's absolutely nothing unprecedented about them. <laughs> They're unprecedented to us, We've never been inconvenienced like this. No one's ever told us, put on that mask. And suddenly we think that the world is coming to an end. In Jakarta or in Erbil, in Bukramanga or in Alexandria, Christians have been wrestling with, what does it mean to be a believer in a hostile culture where we are called to change the world. And there are so few of us. And our resources are so limited. And the opportunities seem to be suppressed at every turn by enemies of the gospel. Their context is but far closer to the context of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Romans. You know the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans is this soaring, soaring sort of theological monument to the wonders of justification by faith and the outpouring of God's sovereign grace on his chosen covenant people. And then he gets to this turning point at the beginning of chapter 12, where the rubber really meets the road, where Paul tells us what it really looks like to resist the world, but in a in a smooth movement, not a separate movement, in a smooth turnaround. Uh, to then radically transform it with the power of the gospel. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And, and do not be conformed to this world. Resist. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may be able to prove. The Greek word there means uh, to make manifest, to, uh, to show forth, so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That's the job of every Christian in every culture, in every century, from the time of the Great Commission, right up to this moment. Sometimes it's, it's baffling to me that we, we've gotten ourselves so worked up about where we are in this culture. And to be sure, we, we've had extraordinary privileges and an outpouring of, of grace, the likes of which the world has hardly ever seen before. If there's anything unprecedented, it's the level of liberty and prosperity that we enjoy. 
Uh, but the mess of our culture, well, we've been making a mess of it for a really long time. This designer disaster has not come upon us suddenly. We, we, we make markers of it when we have uh, these Thunderbolt Supreme Court rulings, but it's been in the works for a really, really long time. And, and the truth is, it's going to take us a while to get out of it. And it's going to require a tremendous amount of work. Now, now the, the natural impulse <clears throat> for all of us is, if not actually to storm the Capitol building and bash in some windows and wear horns and all of that, if not that, we, we, we still have this sort of revolutionary impulse about us. We, we want to do something, and we want it now. And we're going to do it forcefully and manfully. <laughs> That's always been a temptation. Um, William Barker, the a great church historian of the uh, of this generation has said, though the reformers did not see themselves as ad inventors or discoverers or, or creators, I instead seeing themselves as recoverers, if anything at all, uh, yet the effect of their work was convulsive and revolutionary. We use that kind of language all the time. The language of convulsive revolution. Uh, we want that kind of change, and we're always looking for those kinds of tactics. That's how we think of the transformational effect of Protestantism on Western civilization. Sudden, uh, dramatic, uh, comprehensive, irreversible, as if it were somehow akin to the ideological intransigence and the illiberal bloodletting of the 18th century Jacobin Revolution in France or the 19th century Bismarckian Revolution in Prussia or the 20th century Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, or the 21st century moral revolution in modern America. And of course, uh, the, the Reformation bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to those destructive and perverse upheavals. Any comparison is simply to use the common parlance, or what used to be the common parlance, fake news. <laughs> you see, revolution promises quick results. Reformation requires a long obedience in the same direction. Revolution relies on loud and spectacular publicity. Reformation much prefers a quiet and humble reputation. Revolution demands uh, the hard and unrelenting science of charts and graphs and statistics and programs and policies and ideologies. Uh, Reformation is content with the gentle persuasions of faith, hope, and love, covenant and sacrament. Revolution has big plans, amalgamizing fervor and gargantuan purposes, while Reformation has but despised small beginnings. A revolution is undeterred by the facts. A reformation is undeterred by the obstacles. A revolution, like the passing pleasures of sin, never fails to disappoint. Reformation, like love, never fails. One of the things that we have to realize is that if we're going to see real and substantial change, we've got to be in it for the long haul. 
1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the college church door in Wittenberg, but it would not be until the Diet of Worms in 1521 that the breach with Rome was consummated. At that point, Luther only had 25 years to live. Although he filled those years with Herculean work and unceasing controversy, as he lay on his deathbed in 1546, uh, there was no outward assurance that his tiny, struggling, quarrelsome, and disparate movement might survive him. Indeed, if it were not for uh, God's good providence and Suleiman the Magnificent's fulminations in the East to distract the Habsburgs, Protestantism probably would have been harried into hiding and out of practical existence like the Valdensians before them, like the Lawlards, like the Hussites. 25 years. That's all Luther had. 25 years. But then, just five years before Luther's death in 1541, John Calvin returned to the city of Geneva. He had attempted reforming work a few years earlier, beginning in 1536, but in short order, he had been sent scurrying into exile, as reformers are oft want to do. But now, invited to return, he he began that remarkable work afresh, but he would not even have as many years as Luther to do his work. It would just be 23 before he lay on his deathbed in 1564. His Bible teaching and systematizing work, uh, the constantly revised uh, institutes that uh, would most assuredly leave an indelible mark on the church, but as he lay dying, uh, Bootser had already been exiled from Strasbourg. Vire had uh, already been hounded out of Lausanne. Tyndall uh, had been martyred, and the Reformation remained a tiny, isolated island in a sea of hostility. Some historians believe that the legacy of the Reformation was not sealed until the time of the Puritans. Five years after Calvin's death, Thomas Cartwright outlined the demands of the reforming purification of the English church. And over the course of the next hundred years, uh, the Puritans struggled mostly in vain in the face of bloody purges and and cruel rejections and ejections, imprisonment and exile, never maintaining control, never uh, giving sway to the whole of the culture, until at long last a handful of straggling survivors made their way to the new world. Uh, The Roman Catholic uh, friend of G.K. Chesterton and the, the father of the discipline of distributivism, Hilaire Belloc, once said, the church is a perpetually defeated thing which always survives her conquerors. That's really the story of resistance and reformation. It's slow. It's agonizing, and it always looks like defeat, until it doesn't. And those moments when it doesn't uh, come as enormous surprises. So, what should be our posture in this day and time? What, What strategies, what tactics should we undertake? Well, first, let me, let me say 
that there are a whole host of passages of scriptures that give uh, lists of imperatives, stuff that we ought to be doing. Colossians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2. Great lists. I'm going to take us to 1 Peter chapter 1 in a moment, but, but before I do, let me just say a word about time. From your vantage point, it looks like you've got all the time in the world. It, it blows by fast. As Gretchen Rubin has uh, so uh, poignantly pointed out, the uh, days are long, but the years are short. That's why again and again the scriptures underline the importance of every moment that passes. It is an ethical imperative to act. And to act quickly when lives are at stake, when justice is perverted, when truth is in jeopardy, when mercy is at risk, when souls are endangered, and when the gospel is assaulted. Uh, we're exhorted and admonished to make the most of our time in Ephesians 5, to redeem our time in Colossians 4. We're to utilize every day to the uttermost according to Hebrews 13. In short, we're to sanctify the time, a, a notion that's well developed in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Decisiveness, determination, single-mindedness, constancy, diligence, and passion must inform our agenda. Such is the characteristic of holy zeal. Urgency. But at exactly the same time, and in parallel passages, the Bible makes it plain that victory will not be won in a day, no matter how fervently we act. From the first inklings of possible revival and renewal in Northampton, to the outbreak of the Great Awakening under Jonathan Edwards and his friend George Whitfield, from the first inkling to the outbreak was 12 years. 12 years. That's high school, undergrad, master's, and doctorate. 12 years. It will take time, perhaps generations, which is why generational succession is so vitally important. In the interim, uh, we are to rest and rely on God's very great and precious promises, 2 Peter 1. We're to trust that his sovereign purposes will indeed make all things right, that we're to trust in his providence, that it will by no means be thwarted. Though the times are hard and the earth cries out under the burden of wickedness, injustice, perversion, we have the assurance that God's purposes will not ultimately be frustrated. We need not be anxious, Philippians 4, we need not worry, Matthew 6, we need not fret, Luke 12. Instead, we're to be patient in hope, we're to be patient in affliction, and we're to be patient in our preaching, we're to clothe ourselves in patience, we're to endure in patience. Such is the characteristic of godly rest. G.K. Chesterton once uh, described uh, the characteristic of this poor fallen world in which we live. He said, it's like an ogre's castle that must be stormed. And at the same time, it is a cottage in the wood to which we must return at the end of the day to prop up our feet before a fire and take a long slug of grog.
Resistance and reformation call for both urgency and patience. We must be zealous for that which is good and right and true, but we also must persevere in resting in God's good providence and relishing his gifts along the way. J.R.R. Tolkien often asserted that in life as in literature, most shortcuts turn out to be long cuts. That's the way of revolution. Uh, Those who simply stay on task even when urgent distractions are clamoring for their attention are the ones who will resist and reform. Distractions abound. Promises of quick fixes and magic wands are everywhere. Learning how to filter out the white noise of life is one of the greatest disciplines that we could ever develop. Speed and efficiency that defines almost everything that we do. We carry around in our pockets enough computing power to fill vast, vast rooms, larger than this cavernous room back when I was an undergraduate. I remember going to computer class with boxes of cards, which had to be punched with little bits of code in these vast underground caverns that were refrigerated so so as to protect the precious data. We've got more computing power in our pockets, which is why none of us can remember phone numbers anymore. (laughs) We don't need to remember them. They're all on our phone. And we don't have to remember any facts. Was it 1541 or 1546? I don't know. Let's Wikipedia it as if Wikipedia hasn't been weaponized against the truth already. (laughs) Uh, We've gotten to the place where we don't think anymore because we don't have to. Unless, of course, we want to resist and restore. Unless, of course, we want to see real reformation Take hold. A quiet evening. Thinking, reading, talking, musing. No no earbuds. No no background noise. Just the crackle of a fire. And a great big fat book. And a cup of tea that's just not quite large enough. That's a rarity. But that is where resistance and reformation actually begin. Now, I promised before I run completely out of time, that 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read this from the ESV. It's um, a, a little more American than the KJV. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy, and you shall call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways that you inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for your sake, who through him 
are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. And the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. I want you to notice several things, the imperatives that are laid out in this remarkable passage. And I'd like to suggest to you that these are the tactics for real resistance and reformation in our time. First, in verse 13, prepare your minds. Do your homework. Know your stuff. Be with a a ready answer at all times. You're here for a reason. Gird yourself well. It's war. Secondly, verse 13 says, be sober-minded. That's a... A nice biblical way of saying, grow up. (laughs) It's uh, what is sometimes uh, referred to as gravitas. You, You bear with yourself the weight of glory. Look like it. Act like it. Live like it. Third, set your hope fully on grace. This is pretty extraordinary. You know, the high water mark of the Christian life is not sinless perfection. It's not being the best and the brightest. The high water mark of the Christian life is quick repentance. It's running to mercy. It's laying hold of grace, setting your hope fully in grace. Verse 14 says, uh, do not be conformed to the passions that once gripped you in your ignorance. One of the things I love about Jonathan Edwards was he knew his wicked heart well. He explored it, and then he said hedges against it. He wasn't in pursuit of sinless perfection, but he knew that, as John Owen so powerfully said, he needed to be killing sin, or sin would be killing him. Peter says, make sure you're killing sin. In verses 15 and 16, we have these repeated imperatives. Be holy. You are called to be holy. In all of your conduct, be holy. You do realize, right, that the most radical thing that you can do, the greatest rebellion that you can have in American culture today is to simply pursue holiness with all that you are and all that you have. That is the great counterculture. Verse 17, call on the Father. It is always astonishing to me how we can get ourselves all revved up about American culture, but rarely do we find ourselves in those long and protracted concerts of prayer that gave rise to the great revivals and reformations of the past. Who are your prayer warriors? Who are your prayer partners? How many prayer groups are you in? How much time do you invest 
in calling on the Father. You can be smart, you can be gifted, but it is, it is almost a cliche that the smart and the gifted fail. That genius is unrewarded. But the hot pursuit of holiness and the presence of God, that is never unrewarded. And then this. I love this in verse 22. Love one another. Love one another earnestly. Love one another from a pure heart. You do this 1 Peter chapter 1 stuff, you know what? You're going to change the world. Your posts on Facebook aren't going to change the world. Your posts on Gab aren't going to change the world. But your holiness will. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see there? I didn't say Trump or Biden one time. (laughs) But we got right to the heart of it. Let me pray for you. Oh, Father, I thank you for that these sons and daughters of the covenant, and I pray that you would use them. Uh, Use them uh, among the vandals. Use them, Lord in the midst of this poor fallen world. Use them for your glory, Lord, I pray. Bless them. Enable them after they've had their time storming the ogre's castle to find their way back to the cottage in the wood to put their feet up before the fire and to find that big thick book and to drink that cup of tea that's not quite large enough. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been reading your uh, Christian almanac uh, Mm. that you did. That's my morning routine. I read read a page, and then I tweet one of my favorites. So I want to know, am I changing the world by by doing that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I, I don't tweet any longer, but uh, but I do Facebook, and I gab. (laughs) So... You've, you've written a lot of books, and I was just interested to hear what is kind of what you think the most timely, appropriate book that you have written that you would encourage people to, to read. Well, I'm, n- I'm not like uh, Doug, I, uh, Doug Wilson. I, I, I do not have uh, all of my thoughts published. Um, <laughs> He has no unpublished thoughts. <laughs> well, I've, I've written on a lot of subjects, some, some sort of transient. I, I feel like sort of my, the, the, the statement of my worldview and the declaration of my, the, the, the essence of my ministry is in the book, The Micah Mandate. Um, my pro-life books, Grand Illusions, Killer Angel, the Quick and the Dead, uh, Immaculate Deception. Um, th- those are uh, books that I, I think are r- really important for our time. Uh, I've just done a new edition of Killer Angel. I'm working on a new version of uh, Third Time Around now. And um, I hope by next year we'll have a new completely redone Grand Illusions. You know, thousand. Um, a, a, a thousand footnotes just comprehensively documenting the whole horror of the abortion uh, industry and a Planned Parenthood. So those are, um, 
But you know, my, my great passion the last few years has been uh, taking the work of Thomas Chalmers and sort of uh, turning it into more accessible, usable material. I've uh, got these three Bible study notebooks called the Keystones uh, that use his discipleship method. He discipled these uh, remarkable young men that went from Scotland in the middle of the 19th century to the ends of the earth, literally. But I've walked into a little Scottish chapel in the middle of northern Iraq um, with a plaque on the wall that says, you know, from the, you know, it was established by the students of Thomas Chalmers. So, I mean, this is a guy that almost nobody knows anything about, but is so incredibly important. So I, I've worked a lot on that. And uh, just in case you're wondering, so the reason Dr. Grant's here is for the, the missions conference. So if you want to come hear more uh, about that. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk about Chalmers yeah. um, and his work on, on the poor. Yeah. Uh, so we'll open up for uh, audience questions. Just raise your hand and I will call on you. Brian. Do you know how many books he's written? Uh, no, it's about... 70 some odd. I, I bet Doug doesn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I write them, I don't count them. Other questions? So um, you talked about the difference between um, kind of some of the violent revolutions in history um, and contrast. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Alexander Hamilton was right in uh, contrasting the French and the American uh, wars. The French Revolution was a true revolution. Uh, Hamilton hated the word revolution applied to the American War for Independence. Uh, he believed that it was an appropriate use of magistrate interpositionalism. He believed that the revolution had been created by uh, king and parliament. And uh, while there were some true revolutionaries among the founders, people like Thomas Paine, who was, who was genuinely a true revolutionary, and Thomas Jefferson had had those, I mean, he had really strong sympathies when he was in, um, in France during the French Revolution. He wrote back uh, to James Madison and said, uh, you know, a, a little rebellion every once in a while is a good thing. And that's now being trumpeted around Washington uh, a good bit these days. I think that uh, the documents that were produced by the founders, the official documents, are an attempt at a kind of covenant lawsuit sequence against the rebellion of parliament and of king. I think that's the, a, a great way to argue it. But there are always these rogue actors. There are always going to be, you know, the guys who say, he said, it's a fight for our lives. Let's go storm the Capitol. And then they go do it. Uh, and uh, even during the Reformation, you had things like the Munster riots and, and things like that. So you're always going to have rogue actors. Uh, we live in a fallen world, and we are fallen uh, people. So there were some uh, rebellious acts. You know, Vermont uh, separated from Britain and uh, proclaimed their own separate republic. Uh, with Thomas Crittenden as the president and, uh, and the Green Mountain Boys uh, and Ethan Allen. Uh, th that was a separate country, and they were pretty revolutionary, which is why we have Ben and Jerry's today. <laughs> <laughs> um, th that, so, so those impulses are always going to be there. But I think the American War for Independence was largely 
a covenant lawsuit sequence against tyranny. If I could ask just kind of a, a follow-up question to that. So you mentioned that Americans do have this revolutionary uh, impulse. Spirit, yeah, this, yeah. This, this impulse. I wonder with, um, so even when I was in high school, social media, I couldn't like post things on the internet that would get me doxxed or canceled today. Now, you know, someone finds you, what you said in high school and you get fired from your job. Uh, how much of that revolutionary, I don't know, activist spirit has, do you think, been fueled by the social media instant everywhere? Um, well, every generation has its version. So during the time of the Reformation, the printing press um, made, you know, easy distribution, uh, you know, radically different from what just a generation prior had for the dissemination of information. So I think the human impulse is always tyrannical. It's the nature of sin. It's, it is the spirit of Cain, and the spirit of Cain is in, in all of us. I do think that social media makes it way too easy, uh, and so we've seen an acceleration of that with, with social media. But, um, you know, I, I remember uh, hearing Francis Schaeffer uh, talk uh, during the days of solidarity in Poland when the Polish labor movement was rising up against the communist masters in the shipyards of Gdansk. And they had this incredible new technology that made their movement possible, the fax machine. And they used the fax machine to disseminate information quickly all over the country of Poland. And it, it fomented, you know, the rebellion against the communist masters. So that's just a tool that the human heart is gonna, gonna use. And we're always gonna find something. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Ben. So you talked about how we have this urge to just get out and do something right now. Uh, but the real rebelliousness comes in pursuing holiness. How do you apply that to something where, something like abortion, where it, something does need to happen and it needs to happen now? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great um, sort of path to follow. I've been involved in the pro-life movement since uh, 1972, uh, before Roe v. Wade. I was in high school when my district attorney in Dallas, Texas, Henry Wade, uh, had this lawsuit brought by uh, Faye Waddleton and a host of others, and, or Sarah Waddleton, excuse me, um, and a host of others that became the Roe v. Wade case. That started in my town, and I, in high school, got involved. I've been involved in sidewalk counseling, I've been involved in protests, I've been arrested before, I've started crisis pregnancy centers uh, over the years. I, I've done a whole lot of things. I've written books. I've spoken at pro-life uh, events. The most effective thing that I ever do is in ministry to women in crisis. Crisis pregnancy centers is so vitally important. I won't give up going on Friday mornings to pray in front of the abortion clinic that the Lord would... Uh, bring this calamity to an end. I won't stop that. But, but I, I have to prioritize. Wh where am I having the greatest effect? And the greatest effect is in this small, seemingly insignificant thing of sitting down with a girl who's in the midst of a crisis because she uh, had a one-night mistake and now her life has changed. How, how do you walk through that? That's, that's where uh, we can have a tremendous amount of impact. So bottom line is, we do all of the stuff. We stay active, we stay engaged, uh, but we have to keep our priorities straight and realize that if we're doing a bunch of protests, but we're not following it up with the real hard work of day-to-day -day walking with people in trouble. My wife and I have had girls uh, in the midst of crisis pregnancies uh, come and stay in our home. That is not easy. It's usually incredibly disruptive and complicated, 
but it can have enduring results. It's quiet and nobody sees it, but it makes a huge difference. Does that help answer the question? What uh, tactics or resources for prayer would you encourage us to go to, or maybe examples from the Reformation um, history that would be pertinent or helpful for us? I think prayer is always one of those habits that everybody is like, oh yeah, I should be better at prayer. So what practical guidelines or examples would you have for us? That, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I would say, first of all, you should probably have a prayer notebook uh, so that you are, you're making your prayer life tangible. Uh, you should have pr- pages that are devoted to all of the important people in your life. Um, you should have um, opportunities to write down dates when the prayers are actually answered. One of the things that I do is I attach passages of Scripture to almost every person that I'm praying for. And I'll pray that particular passage of Scripture over and over and over again uh, through the course of a a year, perhaps. Um, I've got five people here in Moscow that I pray for every single week that I have uh, prayer, you know, a, a passage of, of scripture that I pray through for those five people. Um, and it's made tangible for, for me because I've got a really nice notebook. Uh, I use a fountain pen. I make it as, as substantial as I possibly can. So it's not this junky little spiral notebook that I, you know, throw in the bottom of my uh, backpack. It becomes, you know, something substantial for me. I, let me recommend, though, that you, uh, I, I try and read at least one really great classic book on prayer every year. Just once a year, a book on prayer. E.M. Bounds is the place to start. Uh, there, he, he wrote about seven books on prayer, but uh, I would start uh, with the method of prayer. Uh, obviously, Matthew, uh, Matthew Henry's little book on prayer is great, and there's, a, there's an app uh, where you can get Matthew Hen- a daily sort of instruction from Matthew Henry on prayer uh, with a prayer that you can pray. Valley of Vision is great. You can pray the great prayers of the Puritans. That's, that's a fantastic resource. Uh, just steer clear of real modern stuff because it gets real sappy and... You could probably do it for quite a while, but in light of the last year and the government overreach, can you speak to the health of the church and any prognostications for the coming year? Yeah, you know, when you're panning for gold, you get a big scoop and then you get rid of all of the junk. In some ways, I think 2020 has been panning for gold. The American church was filled with junk. There was so much of the old normal that needed to end. We should look at the pandemic as God's grace to us. Because the churches that emerge stronger, with clearer vision, and more direct prophetic uh, applications of the Word of God to our day, are going to have a greater impact because the chaff is blown away. I, I, I don't know if I directly answered that question, but... John. So as, as far as like day-to-day uprightness and being more Christ-like and how we can set a good example to be, to be holy, what, what do you think that looks like now amidst our current situation? How can us personally in our day-to-day lives stand up and say, no, this is what's right, this is what is honoring Christ. How how can we do that? Through service. It's simply loving others when it is unexpected, unwarranted, when it looks like grace. Uh, You're uh, in a town that is uh, pretty polarized, like pretty polarized. And um, to 
to stay in our bubble, uh, to have our holy huddle, is uh, not going to win the, the rest of the world. But to serve it, uh, to love it, uh, to pursue it uh, with grace and truth, knowing that, that, that there will be a lot of rebuffing along the way, uh, that, that is the, the pathway to demonstration of holiness. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was always during the times of plague and disaster that uh, the church had its greatest impact in the waning days of the Roman Imperium, in the early days of the barbarian migrations with the rise of Charlemagne, when there was great sickness and everybody else was fleeing, Christians rushed in. Now, that doesn't mean that you just go rushing into COVID households. Uh, what, it, what it means is that you look for opportunities to bless those who hate you. Under what conditions would you advise a state to secede? <laughs> um, under what conditions would I encourage a state to secede? Uh, well, first of all, there would have to be strong concurrence on, on the lower magistrates. Um, and uh, secondly, we'd probably all have to move to Texas. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, it's, it's really interesting. That, that's a question that is hard to answer in light of the bureaucratization of American life and governance. I think uh, right now it's probably a lot more profitable for us to think about seceding from big tech than it is seceding from big government. Indeed, I think perhaps big tech is more powerful than big government. I mean, Biden's hamstrung. He's going to do a lot. I mean, right now, I, I passed through the Seattle airport on the way here, and over and over again, I hear this announcement that it is federal law to wear a mask, which it's not. They've passed no laws. There, there aren't laws about masks. There are only orders. So we've moved from the rule of law to the rule of orders. That's all Biden's got is he's got executive orders. He's already used more executive orders than the previous three administrations in their first 100 days combined. So, um, you know, he's, he's hamstrung. He, the, the thing about executive orders is that they can't endure. They can cause a lot of damage. Uh, they can cost a lot of lives. You know, Mex repealing the Mexico City policy is going to mean the loss of the lives of women and children all around the world. I want to minimize that. But the truth is, is that those executive orders don't have the weight of permanency. They can be reversed in the next administration just as fast as they were put into place. But the stranglehold that big tech has on all of us is enormous. We saw that play out in stunning technicolor with the destruction of Parler, as it's commonly called, even though over and over again on their website they said, look, it's a French word, it's parlay. <laughs> Pierce. In your estimation, in our society today, what are the hills that Christians will be dying on, the ones that are really worth it in terms of changing culture and uh, evangelizing the world that we live in? I think the first line are doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. I think uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists have to make really tough decisions about losing their careers. Uh, and uh, so I think that's that right there is the first line. We, we have turned into a, a kind of uh, medical autocracy. And so, so that, that's probably first line. 
Uh, we're also uh, seeing uh, with uh, the sexual revolution and the transgender revolution, we're watching the end of women's sports as we know it. Uh, and therefore, we've got, uh, we're, we're gonna see a lot of uh, women athletes and women coaches who are going to be put on the front lines and uh, they won't just be canceled. They will be hotly pursued to be tarred, feathered, and hung, drawn, and quartered. It's jihad. That's a great question. First of all, let, let me just say right up front, I am not an anti-masker. You know, I, I think there are, you know, sometimes legitimate reasons why uh, people wear masks that it has nothing to do with fear. It may be they have children with com com compromised immune systems or whatever. And I know all of the arguments about the efficacy of masks or the lack thereof and all of that. I, the, masks are not the issue. Vaccines are not the issue. Uh, when it comes to churches, what, what the real issue is, is does the state have the right to tell a church when and where and how it can worship? When and where and how it can minister? When the church caves in there, they have violated every standard. Forget about Romans 13. They, they have violated the mandate uh, to not abandon the assembling of ourselves together. And so I, I think part of the problem is that so many of our evangelical uh, and reformed churches aren't really confessional. They don't have confessional standards that they can look to and say, okay, this is clearly what the scriptures say that we must do and must not do. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. We, we uh, have to make sure that we do not abandon our primary calling, which is the worship of the living God. Um, secondly, we have to make sure that, uh, you, know, we're, you know, a lot of the stuff that the pandemic has caused people to do, we should have been doing every flu season. You know, washing our hands more, being a little more conscious, you know, I, I, I never even heard of sneezing into my elbow before, but golly, that sure makes sense. You know, I'm not gonna spray the whole room with whatever it is that I've got. Um, so, you know, we, we need to, to not throw the baby out with the bath, you know, recognize that there's some things that uh, this pandemic has uh, brought uh, that we should have been doing all along. Um, but we should never compromise the call of the church to worship. And, uh, you know, I, I know that live streaming means that I now have at our church people from all over the world who come and join us in front of their TV sets or with their laptops and they hear me preach. Oh, joy. I'd much rather that they be with the body of Christ. Now, I, I do know that people with, uh, with very, very compromised immune systems or who are in you know, jeopardy in age categories or health categories, that that becomes a good tool for them. And I thank God for that tool, but I think that uh, much of the church has leaned on that as a substitute for genuine ministry, and I think that that's a disaster. Uh, the cover of the, uh, the London Spectator this week uh, has uh, this uh, ruin of a stone church with a huddle of, you know, 15 believers inside all holding umbrellas in this roofless ruin. And the headline is, 
what will remain of the church after this? It's an incredibly poignant image. 